All right, guys. Good morning. Let's get started. Uh, so, if you if you recall, last session we talked about the one of the variants of um, gradient descent, which was a stochastic gradient descent, in which we uh, we were to shuffle and you know uh, shuffle the training set and pick each of those training set randomly one by one, and given that specific training set, we would uh, you know compute the gradients and this way, our complexity would would decrease a lot, and we were able to apply it for many times. Although this was a noisy, a noisy estimate, nevertheless, we could um, you know compute more iterations faster given larger data sets. So today, we're going to talk about other optimizations that we can apply on top of gradient descent, and one of the well-known optimization that has been there for like I would say 50 years. They're like starting from mid 60s, uh, and it's called momentum. There are so many different variants of uh, momentum um, has been proposed in the literature, so we're gonna touch on some of those. But for the rest, we can just, you know, have a look at it online in uh, in your machine learning libraries or other tools that you're using. All right, so let's just have a recap of um, what we did in a stochastic gradient descent. So in SGD, the, the in sample error of W was, was being calculated by the, the summation of uh, all of those small ENs of vector W, and we, when we would divide it to the number of N for all of them, right? So in the case of um, this e, e of N of W, in the case of linear regression, as you recall, it was computed as... Um, the, the vector of xn transpose multiplied by the vector of weights minus the, the true value, true label yn, and we would raise that to 2. On the case of logistic regression, we would compute it because of the nonlinearity in your sigmoid function. We would compute it as a log of um, 1 minus e to the raise of y, y of n, w transpose xn. So, and the job we had uh, with SGD was to minimize our E of N of W given those W's that we had, right? So let's just recap what the SGD was in a high-level manner in the next slide. So, um, also as another hyperparameter, we mentioned that we could apply, instead of, you know, uh, tweaking and tuning our uh, gradients just for one sample at a time, one training data at a time, we could apply that to a mini bag size of B, and that could be any number, like 10, 20, 50, or the whole batch of the, the training set. So, the SGD algorithm starts for the, uh, the number of uh, epoch you have. Sometimes uh, I've, been, I've seen people pronounce this epic, so uh, I'm not sure which, which version is correct. So probably use it whichever you like. Um, so for epic or epoch from 1 to t, you're going to randomly permute training set. So, this actually represents all your training set. Each of those. Let's see where I am now. So that's your whole data, T D S training set. So you can randomly shuffle and permute this to have different versions, and you would call each of them one epic, like number one, 
number n and you would start applying SGD after you compute your vector of weights at each iteration. Um, so this is another hyperparameter you can, when you train a model, for instance, in TensorFlow, you can define the number of um, epic or epoch you, you want to use with that. All right, um, so the SGD algorithm goes like this. You randomly permute your training set, and for j from 1 up to n divided by b, and this b was your mini byte size, So you compute S of J as an index set <coughs> of the next batch of B samples. So you're, you're uh, processing batch by batch. And you update the, the weight of W as the previous W. So this is the new W. So this is a new W. That was the old one. Minus the gradient and the new direction you found by applying your SGD, right? That's your step size. In most of the cases, you can call it as a learning rate, but sometimes they apply another formulation to, um, to relate a step size with the learning rate. So, and you would update your weight and at the end, you would check if the stopping condition was satisfied. I'll explain what, what could be, you know, uh, assumed as a stopping condition. And if you, if you hit your stopping condition, you could just stop for that. And then the, the loop would close. Yeah, th this could be one of those, yeah. I'll, I'll mention all of those in the next slide, yeah. Yeah. All right, now how, how do... We how do we define the, the stop condition here? So given your f of x as a convex function, so we're going to consider for now only the convex functions. Um, so suppose x star was your gl uh, global minima. Uh, so in a global minima, your gradient of en of w is equal to 0, right? So this could be one of the stopping conditions. The other one is that you can assume E of n is small enough for you that uh, even though you haven't hit the, the global minima, but you said, okay, this is good enough for me, I'm gonna stop right here. Like after many thousands of iterations, you found like one, like zero, 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 two, and then you feel like I don't, I don't need to just go further than this. I don't gain much. Um, accuracy out of that, so I'm just going to stop here, because for me this is small enough. The other is, as you can see in the, in the figure, you, you almost hit uh, somewhere around zero, and this shows that in a convex function, you already hit the, the global minima, right? And the third one is sort of a, a mix of the, the first two is, you have passed so many number of iterations, and you are in like a step million, two million or ten million, and you can't just simply you know wait more. So you're gonna stop there, because as as I explained last time, um, for instance, training AlexNet in TensorFlow, like I was um, getting around um, sort of seventy eight percent top five accuracy, which means that each of uh, I had five shots in order to 
predict that specific label of a given image. And if either of these five are correct, so I'm, I'm going to have that uh, predicted as, 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 a, as a correct one. And that's, that's going to be called top five. If you, if you are talking about the top one accuracy, it's just to have only one chance to predict. And if it was correct, uh, good. If it's not, you, you, you had a misprediction, right? So in the top five accuracy of AlexNet, save it two million iterations, I was hitting this. And after eight million iterations more, I had only like less than one less than one percent more in accuracy. So that means my loss function didn't improve that much after eight million iterations more. So I stop here, right? Although I, I, that was not a global minimum, but it was good enough to just use your model. So this could be another uh, condition you want to consider. All right. So now let's talk about the other type of functions that are not convex. Um, fortunately, logistic regression, the thing sample error, gives you a, a convex function. But in real world applications, you're gonna you're gonna face so many different uh, type of um, functions that are non-convex. Yeah. No, number of iterations was was each of those uh, each of those batches. Yeah. yeah. No, because uh, you, you you can you can iterate over epochs for many times, right? But um, at some point, you just you either hit in a plateau or your algorithm couldn't perform better. So it's just a waste of time to compute more, right? Either you have to change your hyperparameter, or you change your architecture, the way you optimize it, or you change your optimizer, like it's going from gradient descent to a stochastic or momentum that we're going to uh, discuss about it today, or you just have to stop. Well, yeah. Wouldn't you figure out that max number and then uh, put that as like the max epoch number? You, you can define it. You can define it as well, yeah. yeah. All right. So. We, we, we brought these three different uh, types, I, I guess, some sessions ago, but let's just have a recap here as well. So sometimes in your function, you have multiple stationary points, like x1 and x3 here, in which x1 is local minimum, or local minimum, and x3 was your global, and x2 was your global max, right? So both here and here, you're going to have also, if you consider the maximum, in all these three points, your, your derivative of the function is zero, right? Thus, uh, the gradient descent could, could get confused and converge to either of x1 or x3 if, it's, um, if it was to find the, the, the global minima, right? So in practice, we, we, we notice that either of these two are giving us surprisingly good um, accuracies. But if you want to find a global one, one of the things that you can do as, as, a, as a workaround, you can restart your algorithm from different, different side of the, the function. Like you started it once here, maybe, and then it stopped here after certain iterations. So the other type is uh, you can start it here starting point. Or you can start it here and compare the results, right? This is one way to overcome this challenge. <clears throat> it's not readable, right? I forgot my glasses, so uh, <laughs> I think even with that, yeah, it's not readable. <laughs> so like this case, in this case, Gradient descent could converge to either right. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, like, uh, with gradient descent, you could also do the matrix multiplication. Uh, so if you were doing that, there's multiple local minimums. What would that give you? Would it just give you, like, glimmer, which? I, I didn't get your question. So, so, so like, uh, let's say you have multiple 
Yeah. Okay. And then also with gradients and the previous matrix multiplication, get the minimum. Okay. Like what would that typically give you? Uh, it, it, so, so, so with gradient descent, it just uh, helps you helps you move toward the, your your local minima or global minima, right? right. Just uh, I, I I always um, I always exemplify it as sort of you are on top of a hill and you have a rolling ball, okay? You roll it down the hill. Gradient descent is 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 the 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 physics behind helping rolling the ball towards downhill, right? right. And it's going to stop when it hit the bottom. So that bottom uh, could be a local, could be a global one. We can tweak it a little bit just to pass the local and goes towards the, uh, the global. But yeah, just think about it that way. So it's, it's going to help you start from here and, and roll your ball towards going down. It, it, doesn't, it just gives you the next best direction and next best step size to, to choose, right? The other computations is, is done within your algorithm. Yeah. All right, the other case of our non-convex function was in a case that you have a higher polynomial order. In that case, you have a saddle point. So the, the derivative of that on the first order is going to be 0, right? But it's, it is not representing a, a local or global maximum or minimum, right? So we need to modify it a little bit in order to calculate the not, you know, to not get stuck in, in that point. So one way is like using your second order derivation and the other is like using momentum that we're going to talk about it today. So when we hit this point, how are we going to, how are we going to use another force Call it V to pass it and go downhill. So this is another example. All right, and a third one, as, as we discussed um, before, when you have a plateau in your function, again, you're going to have, depending on the, the slope of this, you're going to have prime equal to zero, close to zero at least, and it's going to so your algorithm gets stuck there. So the other option is to restart your algorithm for another point. Starting so starting so you went from here and then you couldn't converge to a to a lower error. Your const function wouldn't change. So you might you might consider starting it from another point of the in your function and you go down. Remember this function is unknown to you. You just um, you're mimicking the behavior by. Uh, using the Taylor series and gradient descent at each iteration. Also another thing you can consider is like you can choose a, a larger step size and hopefully you're gonna pass here, right? So if you would like to, that's another option as well. <coughs> All right, now let's talk about momentum. Um, so you see most of the, the literature on optimizations and convex optimizations are coming from operation research and it was closely tied to mathematics and also operation research as well. So you might, that's why you see so many mathematicians in, in 60s and 70s and 80s, they were trying to optimize uh, the process to find a global 
minima in, in, a, in a comics or non-comics functions. So one of the, one of the most well-known algorithms was momentum-based methods. So it was proposed by uh, a Russian mathematician, uh, Boris Polyak. So it's, it's pretty old, 1964. And he was basically uh, proposing an update, a variant to be applied to your SGD. So the, best, uh, the, the basic SGD update is your GT, your gradient is, you compute this gradient uh, ENWT and your new weight, the weight that was assigned by the SGD is going to be the old one minus the step size of T multiplied GT, right? So that was the, the vanilla case, that was the default SGD case. So what um, momentum brought here is we can compute another vector here called V of T as a momentum of our action and it's related to the, to the step size and a gradient as before but what we add here is another hyperparameter so in some literature they call it beta so here we call it a mu and you divide it to the previous uh, vector of t vt minus 1 so this way if you hit some point that were not supposed to be global or, or local minima this vector help you just move past the point and through experimentation so through experimental results people found that the a good point a good hyperparameter for this is 0 0.9 um, right so as an example so in a case of saddle point you, you hear you you found your uh, GT is equal to 0 because F prime was 0 right here but this vector of VT because of the momentum it had from the previous VT minus 1 it's gonna help you pass the point and, and, and go downhill you'll probably find a global one here right so you want to get a start here another example is when you have multiple stationary points and that was your that was your local and that was your global right the vector of VT help you as what is called the, the the momentum helps you to just get past it it's just like that that example that I mentioned you're rolling a ball although it hits a, a plateau or just an uphill because it had that stationary it had, it had this momentum vector behind it's gonna go past it <coughs> and that was the basic idea behind momentum based methods so now we're gonna talk about other variants of this and more optimal more optimized version of the the first case of momentum um, later on as well All right, so let's visualize the, <coughs> the cost function and see how, how it does help us. So suppose you have two, two x's, x1 and x2 here. So this is going to be your f, f of x1 and 2. And in higher dimensional space, so 
one direction would be your u and the other one which is perpendicular to that is going to be v so with, with the stochastic gradient descent we start from here suppose you started from here the starting point because you're using mini batches or single training examples you're wasting so much space in order to start going and, and converging to the local minimum right because the other case would be you just avoid all these wobblings like this and go this direction more and go this direction less right so we want we want this in, in a 2d dimension we want to minimize going this direction in a vertical way and we want to maximize this so we want this more in a 3d space it's, it's, it's going to define in another way so we want to go towards this and this more right so momentum based methods can help us to convert in lower number of iterations with, with less wobbling up and down so if you slice this in, in, in two, two different directions so one to the case of u so you slice it this way and another, uh, another time you slice it from the vector of v you're going to have two different let me clear this out um, So you just, if you slice this along the U, which was this, to look at it in the horizon, so you're going to have this, right? And you see it's, it's, it's going as a slow progress because <clears throat> it doesn't move towards the U duration enough for us. We want to make it faster, right? On the other hand, if you slice this along the V vector, so you're going to see the, the depth of that is going very steep, right? It's wobbling too much. You want to make it lower. And thus, momentum-based um, methods, the, the original momentum that I discussed and the other version that I'm going to discuss uh, in, in the next slide, it's going to help us optimize both ways. So instead of going, let me just write it down here, maybe. Instead of going this way you want to go you prefer to go that way and this is the job of the vector v to help us here I'll show you another example So this, this alpha is either step size or learning rate. That's the U vector. This is the V. Okay, so it's like instead of going towards the blue arrows, which was the, the old SGD here, the vector of V help us to avoid this wobbling in, in, in both directions. 
and we go this way using v2, v3, and 4 in, in each iteration using a momentum based method, right? This is another way to, to showcase it. <clears throat> right, although this method was, was helping uh, stochastic gradient descent a lot, still it wasn't converging, um, you know, fast enough for many of the many of the uh, recent algorithms or recent or recent training models that, that we wanted to have. So another mathematician called Nesterov, also another Russian mathematician, uh, proposed another method of his own, and and, and that is known as uh, Nesterov's momentum. Nineteen eighty three. So, and it was later called as Nesterov's accelerated gra gradient descent. So, he still kept the, the vector of V there as the old momentum, which was here for the weight updates. And that was pre previously there for your SGD. That was your momentum. So, he added an intermediate point. to accelerate the, the convergence rate of uh, the default momentum base. So we would, to, we would have to compute the gradient at this intermediate point as well. And this, 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 will, this will help us even more to converge faster regarding the, the, the default version of momentum. And the complexity is not that high. So the, the steepest gradient descent, as we know already, it was the order of 1 over k, and k was the number of iterations. So the Nesterov's momentum uh, brought this 1k raised to the 2. Okay? And this is, um, this is mostly well known as, as, as the, the momentum now. I'll show an example of the, the comparison between these and a bunch of other uh, algorithms that are recently proposed. And we're going to see which one works better, right? So now if you... All right, if you take a, take a look at the, the literature, there are so many other optimizations defined, proposed, and applied, and some of them are well used. So I just brought other two here. It's, they're outside the, the scope of your work, but it's going to be helpful to know at least what they are because um, in TensorFlow, in Cafe, and other PyPorch, so you're going to see their uh, definition and implementation there, so might as well know uh, what they does. But it's, these are just going to be outside the, the scope of your exam. So the other well-known one is called RMS prop, and it stands for root mean square update. So instead of using a momentum base, it's going to use it still uses that, and it 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 incorporates the the root mean of the square update as well to the to the momentum base. The other one is called Adam adaptive momentum estimation. So it's basically an incorporation of RMS prop and the momentum itself. So it uses both the, the root mean square and also the, the momentum as well. So interestingly enough, uh, Adam, the, the, one of the collaborators, was uh, a former PhD student at the University of Toronto, Jimmy Ba, and he's currently a professor at CS department. Um, so I found, a, I found a comparison in their paper, so that was proposed in the, the Adam paper. So you can see some of the variants of, so this is the number of, the x-axis stands for the number of iterations, and this is the training cost that we want to minimize, and the data set used was mnest. So they use another uh, 
thing uh, as as dropout. So this 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 was also proposed by Jeffrey Hinton like 2014, if I'm not wrong. So it's another hyperparameter you might you might see in uh, in the machine learning libraries, and it basically helps us to avoid overfitting. Normally the the rate they use for dropout is 50 percent. It's like when you train your model, you drop out half of the the nodes in order to overfit. So this has shown that it's going to help you a lot to converge faster and avoid overfitting. Yeah. Um, so just just to just to know that. So you see that the um, at a grad so which is another one is working here performing at this point, at, at this function. Uh, Adam outperformed uh, all of them. SGD with Nesterov was sort of here in the middle of these four, and RMS prop was there. So, you know, it's, uh, th there are even more algorithms mentioned um, in literature, but these are the, the more well-known ones. Um, that's what, if, if you, if you also have a look at the, like this is TensorFlow. So in, in the class of TN train of optimizer, you can see all these different version of um, like gradient descent optimizer, Adagrad, momentum based, or you, you come down in the list, you might find Adam, yeah, Adam optimizer. There are like, And someone related as well. So let me see if we can find. Yeah, momentum as well. So they are in the class optimizer, anyways. So yeah, just just to let you know, if you wanted to play with this stuff, you know at least what they are. Questions. But for your uh, for your exam, you just need to know the. The gradient descent, the stochastic gradient descent, the, the, the default momentum, and the Nesterov's momentum. All right. If there are no questions, I'm just going to stop here, and next session we're going to talk about uh, the, the logistic regression on multi-classes. And then from next week, we're going to start neural networks. Okay? Right. Have a good day, guys.